Hello and welcome to this webinar on Diversity Matters in 2021, part of our In the Pipeline series. I'm Anna West, one of the Knowledge Council in the employment team. And I'm Matthew Evans, one of the associates. In this webinar, we're going to look at the diversity issues which we think will be top of the HR agenda in 2021. And these are around pay reporting, diversity monitoring, investigations, policies and training. So let's start off by looking at pay reporting. Thanks, Anna. As with almost all aspects of employment law, the gender pay gap reporting obligations have also been impacted by COVID-19. As you know, employers with 250 or more employees have to report on their gender pay gap, and reports have to be in by the 4th of April for the previous reporting year. In March 2020, the government suspended enforcement of the 4th of April 2020 reporting deadline in light of the pandemic. That 4th of April deadline applied for gender pay gap reports for the pay year to the 5th of April 2019. Many employers would have already published their 2019 reports by March 2020, but if they hadn't, then they would not have had to do so. So as we are now approaching the 4th of April 2021 deadline for the reporting for 2020, it's worth just reminding ourselves of what needs to be reported on. Employees with 250 or more employees on the snapshot date being the 5th of April in the relevant year, are required to publish the following data. Firstly, the mean and median gender pay gap based on average hourly pay as of April 2020. Secondly, the proportion of male and female employees in each of four pay bands, known as quartiles, based on the employer's overall pay range. This will show that the gender pay gap differs across the organisation at different levels of seniority. And finally, information on employers' gender bonus gap, showing the difference in the mean and median bonuses for women and men over a 12-month period, as well as the proportion of male and female employees who received a bonus in the same 12-month period. Currently, there is no legal obligation on employers to provide a narrative explaining their gender pay gap stats and any disparities, but this is highly encouraged, and in practice, many employers want to include a narrative to give the context behind their figures. So if the pay figure is based on pay in April 2020, some employees may have been on furlough on 80% of pay at that time. So what impact will that have on the pay gap reporting requirement? Well, furloughed employees will need to take it into consideration when businesses are determining whether or not they have 250 employees. For example, a company which has 400 employees in total would need to report, even if say 300 of those employees were not actively working on the 5th of April 2020 as a result of being placed on further leave. But what about the pay calculations themselves? Well, we talked about the different figures you have to report and the treatment of third employees will depend on whether you're calculating the hourly pay gap or the bonus pay gap. If the third employees were on reduced pay in April 2020, and most third employees probably would have been, then they are not included in the pay gap calculations based on hourly pay. However, if you topped up their pay to full pay in April, even though they are on furlough, then you will need to include them in the calculations. It's a bit different for the bonus figures though. You would still include all employees in these calculations, whether furloughed or not, and regardless of whether they got reduced pay during furlough or it was topped up. So if your employees got reduced pay during furlough, and as you say, most of them probably would have done, then they come out of the hourly pay gap calculations altogether. And that presumably means your pay gap could be quite different from the previous year. That's exactly right. And something which has been featured in the news reports recently has been the impact of furlough on female workers. There was a report published in November 2020 by the Women's Budget Group, which analyzed furlough data published by HMRC. This report found that between March and August 2020, approximately 133,000 more women than men have been furloughed. That is largely due to the nature of the sectors and roles where furlough is being used most. If you have staff on furlough, then depending on the makeup of your workforce and the proportion of male and female staff in the roles that were furloughed, your pay gap figures and quartiles may look quite different for 2020 as opposed to previous years. This will mean that your narrative to explain the reasons for the different figures will become particularly important. And whilst we're on the subject of pay reporting, there was a consultation a couple of years ago on ethnicity pay gap reporting, if I remember rightly. Can you remind us where we've got to on that? That's right. In late 2018, the government launched a consultation on introducing ethnicity pay reporting for employees with 250 or more employees. 
The results showed that 73% of respondents supported compulsory ethnicity pay gap reporting, although the government has not yet responded to this consultation. But despite the lack of response from the government, this initiative has been gathering momentum nonetheless. A poll of more than 100 companies carried out by PwC has revealed that the proportion of companies calculating their ethnicity pay gap increased considerably between 2018 and 2020, and many employees are choosing to publish their ethnicity pay gap voluntarily, even though there is no requirement to report this data yet. In October last year, the CBI announced the launch of Change the Race Ratio, a campaign to increase racial and ethnic participation in British business. This campaign calls for the disclosure of ethnicity pay gaps by 2022 at the latest. So it seems likely that we will see compulsory ethnicity pay gap reporting in due course. It's just not clear at the moment exactly when. It's also not clear yet what sort of breakdown of the ethnicity pay gap employees will have to provide. For example, will it be BAME and non-BAME, or will it be broken down into more detail? Given that we are likely to see compulsory ethnicity reporting at some stage in the near future, then if you haven't done so already, you might want to start having a look at your figures at this stage to see what your ethnicity pay gap looks like. That of course relies on you actually having the data to enable you to do this. This may be less straightforward than gender data, which is perhaps more readily available to employers. So you will need to think carefully about what information you already collect and whether this is the right data or whether you need to revisit this. And on this note, we have been seeing more of a focus on collecting diversity data more generally in the last year or so, haven't we? Yes, that's right. We have seen a noticeable increase last year in clients who want to start or step up their diversity monitoring as part of their efforts to tackle inequality at work. Diversity monitoring can be a very good way of establishing where you have lack of representation in the workplace and the reasons for this so you can try to address them. But there are a few things to think about both in terms of practical issues and also from a data protection angle. The first thing to think about is what sort of level of monitoring you want to do and what you hope to achieve with that. There are a range of different types of monitoring. The most basic would be an annual snapshot of the workforce on an anonymous basis. For example, you send around a survey which you ask employees to complete, which asks for their sex, ethnicity, age range, religion, sexual orientation, whether they have a disability, but no details which would identify them. That will give you a picture of how the profile of your workforce changes over time and whether any measures which you take are having an effect. You could go for a bit more detail by asking employees to include, say, their seniority or job grade, if that wouldn't give their identity away. And that's easier in a larger workforce than a smaller one. And whichever approach you take for your existing staff, you may also want to consider whether to do any monitoring in your recruitment to help you see if there might be any issues there. So, for example, if the range of people you recruit is less diverse than the range of people who apply, this may raise some questions about your process. If you do this, you should make sure that the forms are completed anonymously and separate from the application itself, because the information you're collecting should only be used for monitoring purposes. Now, all of that monitoring I just described is anonymous, which means you won't have any personal data about the individuals. And there is a reasonable amount of information you can get from this anonymous monitoring. As you can see how diverse your workforce is, where there may be a lack of representation and where there may be issues with recruitment. But we are seeing more employers wanting to do a more detailed analysis than this, and therefore looking at monitoring on a non-anonymous basis, i.e. where individuals can be identified. So they can look at the reasons why there might be a lack of diversity at certain levels by looking at things like promotion opportunities for individuals, for example, or exit interview information. So presumably, if you are collecting diversity information about identifiable individuals that you need to think about GDPR as well? Yes, that's right. There are GDPR considerations because you're dealing with personal data and much of this is sensitive or special category data, namely information about an individual's race or ethnicity, religious belief, health or sexual orientation. That's all special category data to which more stringent rules will apply. So you'll need to make sure you comply with GDPR if you're collecting diversity data on a named basis. And you'll also need to think about it if you're collecting it on an anonymous basis, but you may be able to identify the individuals. For example, if there are a few people in a certain type of role, you might be able to work out who they are from the information they provide. Now, GDPR is a whole topic in itself, which I wasn't planning to go into in detail in this webinar, but I thought I would just flag a few headline points that you would need to think about. So first, you need to have grounds for processing 
personal information. Here, you'll probably be rely relying on consent. With collecting this type of data, will always be on a voluntary basis. You can't require anyone to provide it if they don't want to. You also need to think carefully about the information you give employees when you ask them for their diversity information, because you need to explain why you're asking for it and what you plan to do with it. Also, as I'm sure you know, you have more general obligations to tell employees about the data you hold on them, what you do with it, who has access to it, what rights they have in relation to it, and your data retention policies. You should already have all of that covered in your staff data privacy notice, but you may need to update this notice to reflect any new diversity monitoring which you decide to do. And you'll need to make sure that the diversity information you collect is kept securely and only accessed by a limited number of people, those who really need to see it, such as certain members of the HR team, and they only access it for the purpose of diversity monitoring and reporting. Now, there are lots of good reasons for carrying out more detailed monitoring and analysis because it can help to pinpoint the causes for a lack of diversity in your business. But just one word of warning, if you think you do want to start monitoring or increase the diversity monitoring that you're doing, you should decide at the outset what information you want to collect and what you're trying to achieve by collecting that information and then make sure you follow through and carry out that analysis. If you collect the information and don't do anything with it, that's worth not collecting it at all because you're holding sensitive information unnecessarily, which is not in line with data protection principles. So we've talked about collecting and analysing data in terms of pay gaps and diversity monitoring. What about other issues that we're likely to see in the spotlight this year? Well, we did a lot of work last year on investigations arising from harassment complaints, and this looks set to continue this year as well. In recent years, we have seen the Me Too movement leading to increased reporting of sexual harassment concerns, both historical and recent. This has led to many more individuals coming forward and speaking out, and sometimes employees reviewing historic investigations which they felt had not been carried out properly. As a result of the Black Lives Matter movement, we may well see the same happening in relation to historical instances of race discrimination and harassment. Clearly, it's important that employers carry out full and thorough investigations into any discrimination or harassment allegations, however long ago the events may have been. And I think we are likely to see a continued focus on investigations in 2021. And on this subject, I think it was about a year ago that we saw new guidance published by the Equality and Human Rights Commission on harassment at work. Have there been any further developments on that front? You're right. In January last year, the EHRC published technical guidance on harassment at work, which made various recommendations. Uh, they suggested that employers should have a detailed anti-harassment policy, which deals with all the different types of harassment and also third party harassment and gives examples which are relevant to the particular workplace. It also advises that all staff should have training in the policy. And the guidance was intended to form the basis of a statutory code of practice on harassment at work, which the government consulted on around 18 months ago. But that hasn't been published yet, not surprisingly, given the current situation, although we will see it at some stage. However, I do think it's worth, in the meantime, taking a fresh look at your diversity and harassment policies, if you haven't done so recently, to see if they would benefit from more detail and some practical examples. In particular, I think it's a good idea to look at them in light of the increasing focus on complex gender identities such as transgender, non-binary and gender fluidity. This issue has been in the news in recent months outside the employment arena. And we also saw uh, the employment tribunal case of Jaguar Land Rover last year involving an employee who identified as gender fluid and non-binary and successfully claimed gender reassignment, discrimination and harassment. And I think this case has really raised awareness of complex gender identities and what a particularly sensitive area this is. So if you're reviewing your equality and harassment policies, do make sure they cover these complex gender identities and are clear on the need to respect these differences. And more generally, we're seeing a lot of businesses moving to gender neutral terms in their communications and policies. We've done this in our firm in line with, in line with other law firms. So that's something to consider if you're reviewing your handbook or policies. Now, as I mentioned a moment ago, the EHRC guidance recommended that all employees should have diversity training. This is quite topical because we've just seen a recent case on this, haven't we? Yes, we have. The case of Ali Limited in Galen. This case involved an employee who made racist remarks to one of his colleagues who then claimed racial harassment. The employer argued that the employee who had made the comments had had diversity training and that this meant the employer had done all it could to prevent the employee from harassing others. 
but the Employment Appeal Tribunal disagreed. It said the training was not very good quality and also that it was stale because it had taken place a while ago and had not been regularly refreshed. This case is a good reminder that as well as having your equal opportunities policies in place, you should also make sure your staff have regular and up-to-date training on those policies. So we hope this webinar has given you a few things to think about on the diversity front in 2021. If you have any questions, please feel free to get in touch with either of us or with your usual contact in the employment team. Thank you for listening and we'll see you next time.